So the first layer of load balancer is uh, the GOB. We have a software <coughs> called Cartographer. We made that at home. We used to use business solutions for this, but they were all horrible for this scale. They are pretty good for like medium scales, but when you go to this scale, uh, they just like they, they didn't want to solve the problems to us anymore because we were probably the only client that they had with this challenge. So they just like, hey guys, make your own solution and we'll, don't bother us. <laughs> so we started doing the, the, this solution. So basically, uh, uh, so the whole thing is we have all the NIST resolver, each provider has a few resolvers, and uh, we try to create a big map of them and attach them to the closest edge. Edge pop is the same thing, use the both words. And uh, also, besides of this, it's not only, like, I could, it, it could be as easy as getting or get the whole Detroit area and a route to Chicago. That would be super simple. But what if Chicago is over capacity? Because it has traffic from, from all, all over the place around Chicago. So besides of this, cart cartographer takes care of the both things. It also, it, it has like a big vision of the world of all the clusters and know how much capacity it can have and how much capacity is handling it. So imagine a, a, a traffic like this, and uh, we have like, this is very common. And uh, so we have like a limited capacity here. So I have a pop, let's say, let's say that I open a pop here in the tribe. I'll have a fixed limit of RPS that I can do. Let's say 100,000. So I can't, I can't send more traffic than this. So I need to shed that traffic to other pops. So cartographer takes care of this. So one of the way cartographers know which pop so when you have like your, your resolver, your let's say Comcast Detroit. When you have Comcast Detroit, we try to create a list of the best pops to go. Right? So the best would be Chicago, then let's say would be like New York and all that. <coughs> so we need to create that list. So the we have a system called Sonar. That's very interesting. That we made a home as well. So basically we do a sample experiment for like 0.001% of the users. So those users that are selected to do the experiment, basically, when they access Facebook, they fetch a profile picture from each different form. And uh, then the user will send the result to us, okay, I got the profile pictures from, for, from these pops, and this was the latest, how, how, how many milliseconds it took to take from each of the pops. And then we have a lot of data coming from the users, and then we have a big map reduce job in Hadoop that will calculate, okay, this resolver here in Comcast, Detroit, the best pops will be Chicago, then New York, then Miami, then whatever. Do you keep your time to live low just in case you have a congestion, say, at Chicago, that it quickly will revert, or is it, if it's cash, that it's going to keep doing Chicago? <coughs> no, we, we usually ship the traffic every five minutes. So if you notice that Chicago is overloaded, we'll ship traffic away from Chicago in the next five minutes. Well, I'm talking about if, like, say, for instance, <coughs> here in the library, the DNS is cached. How long do you, do you keep the cache oh, uh, time low? Or two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Yeah, but not everybody respects it. We expect this. Usually, the browser, because we have the DNS to tell, but the worst thing against us is not the DNS; it's the browser pre-establishing. So, if you're using a, a modern browser like Chrome or Safari or even Firefox. The browser will keep the connection open for several minutes if you have the tab. So usually people access Facebook and they leave Facebook open like four hours. And the browser will keep like a pool of connections open. So even if the DNS changes and the, you, you go to Facebook and you click like or whatever, the browser will try to use the same connections. So that's why when we ship the traffic to a different pop, the traffic doesn't move with it. So I'll show a graph later that shows the decay, like when we move the traffic and when it actually happens. And the, the, Main culprit for this is the browser. And, uh, but the DNS is two minutes. Usually, sometimes it's one minute. But one minute, we, we didn't notice a big difference between one and two minutes. So we did it two minutes. And uh, so basically, that, that, that's what we do. It's a, it's, a, it's a very, very simple experiment. So it's very likely that you will never see it. But if you have the chance to see it, you'll notice that even if each profile picture will be fed to a different form. The way that we do it is to because the problem that we have is the DNS cache. And we need to skip the DNS cache in order to fetch one profile picture from any different pop. So the way that we solve this problem is by using random host names. So we have, for each profile picture that we were fetching, we will have a different host name. 
So there is a 100% of chance that host name won't be cached in ISP because it's new. It's new. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the, the diagnosis, like the, the profile, the, the diagnostic tool in Chrome, you notice that each profile picture is being fetched from a very different host name. And that host name will never be repeated because we don't want, we don't want, we don't want to take the chance of the ISPs to cache this. And that, that's the way we solve the problem. So when we have a DNS request, that's the only information that we have. We have a unique host name because we know that what we were trying to translate, and we have the resolver API address. So a common misconception is that when uh, when somebody is querying us for the host, the IP address for WWW in other host, people think that we have the client IP address, but we do not. We only have the resolver IP address. So when you ask when you ask your ISP for an IP address. The ISP resolver will ask their IP address in your mouth. And the, the, the server on the other side will never know the, the, the actual client IP address. There is an extension to the DNS protocol, it's called eDNS0, that supports this. So Google will start supporting this with the 8888, and OpenDNS already supports this. Uh, the reason they support this is that it's, it's very difficult for us to route, route people that are using Google DNS to the closest point. Because they are all querying the same DNS uh, server, right? So the only thing that we know is that oh, this query, this query is coming from Google, and I don't know what to do with it because I don't know where the user is, where the user. Is. So this is a big problem with the eDNS zero extension. Google will tell us, "Hey, I'm Google, and I'm asking for that, that, that Facebook and This is the client, and then they can ask the client. There, there, there is a lot of uh, things for privacy, so they can ask. They show only the first 24 bits instead of 32 bits. So we don't need the 32 bits to route the user. We do only need to know the network so we can cross the user with the geotag and all the other information that we have. So we can use it, we can route the user to the closest one. So, and uh, we do not support that yet. This is in development and uh, we'll push this in, in production in the next month. So today, if you are using uh, the Google DNS, there is a pretty big likelihood that we are, you are misrouted to, to some of the pop that is not the best. There's a problem. Probably close to the DNS server. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> Google has a pretty good infrastructure here in most of the countries. So I think here in the US, it is not a problem. If you are like in the Central Africa and the closest 8888 would be like Europe, we will probably want you to Paris instead of routing you to Cairo. That would be the closest. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so once you fetch the picture, actually, so the first thing that you need to do is to translate this address, and then you fetch the, the, the picture. So when you fetch the picture, we, we have all the information. So you have the unique host name, so we can correlate this. We have the client IP address, because you were fetching, actually. So we can cross this. And we have the run through time, because after fetching the picture, all the pictures, the, the browser will create a, a JSON structure and will send to us, like uh, with all the list of pictures and all the run through time. So we, when we have more and more and more information of this, we can Cut mm -hmm. out layers and we have like a very precise thing. This is pretty cool, and uh, this is the way we solve the DNS routing across the board. And this works amazing. Mm -hmm. So when we put when we first put this in action, <coughs> and uh, we we start with two clusters. So the other, the correct lines here, the good lines, we're using <laughs> the old system, the business solution. <laughs> and then we <coughs> we, were, we were pretty well in the plan. No, our system we brought like much better. And then we put this in action. This one. And uh, so basically, as the traffic went up to one, it went down to another because it was overreacting. Yeah. So imagine like you were driving your car and the, the car starts to steer to the left, and then you do like a big correction to the right, and then you, you have to correct the problem to the right, and then you create like a huge wave of overreaction. And then yeah, it took us like <laughs> several weeks to figure out the problem. And we really didn't understand what's going on because like we were reacting correctly, but why we're just amplifying the wave of like mistake that was, was happening. And then we eventually fixed it. And the problem is that I was talking before, I was talking about it before, is that the the amount of time that it takes for us to move DNS traffic from one side to another. Because we're not taking into consideration the established connections from the browser. We're only taking into consideration the DNS detail. So we thought that if we change the IP address and we have a TTL of two minutes. In two minutes, the whole, all the traffic, most of the traffic, yeah. the next block. And actually, it was taking half an hour. 
And why half an hour? Like, even if the DNS servers they don't respect the TTL, like they they want they want like respect to the point of going from two minutes to thirty minutes. It could like go to three or five minutes, but not half an hour. And then we start studying this and got this conclusion basically. So so most of the traffic will ship in the first 10 or 15 minutes. Then we have a huge long tail of traffic. So this is pretty <coughs> really great. Especially cheap farmers, those feature farmers that we sold in India and China, they, they really do not respect this. So when they get the IP address, they want to cache the IP address for like 12 hours. They, they really <laughs> don't care about like what the what TTL is. So it's very common when we drain pops, like let's say it's like 7.40 now and I drain a pop now, tomorrow morning I'll still get traffic. It's very, very low, <coughs> but it's a huge long time. So basically, we so we stood that decay curve for, for several days and we come to a mathematical model. So the, the real is the, the, the red one and the green one is the predicted. So we have this prediction curve now in cartographer. So when cartographer moves track from one pop to another, it will, it will wait for the whole eighty-five percent of the curve to actually happen before <coughs> doing before doing an overreaction on that thing. So that fixed the previous, previous problem. So if you look at the graphs today, it's much more beautiful. It's horrible. Yeah, it's right. Right. So we have all the time zones there. But if you look at it correctly, you notice that <coughs> this is when we start sharing. So basically, the traffic is ramping up. The traffic would go, in orga the organic traffic would go all the way up here. But cartographer notices that the pop is close to 100% capacity, so it starts shedding the traffic on the pop. So when we are here, basically we are at peak. So you notice that those curves are happening in different time frames. That's because the because of the, the plants rotating. So we have peaks in different times. So. So this works pretty well. So we never had a problem anymore. And, uh, hmm. So this is the topology. If you look at the given cluster, right? We have we, the way we lay out the network. We have data center, and each data center has a couple of clusters, like ten or twenty, and uh, each cluster has like a bunch of machines, ten thousand. And uh, this is the way we 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 lay out the clusters so from a network perspective. Network perspective. So the first thing that we have in the data center, that's out of the cluster. So the cluster would be this boundary. And uh, we have the DRs. The DRs are the data center routers. So we usually have a couple of them, like four or six or eight or something like that. They are huge boxes. Like they weigh like a thousand pounds. And they are a whole rack, like hundreds of interfaces all taken a bit. And uh, so those routers, with those routers, we talk to trans, we talk, we talk to the backbone, and we talk to peers. And then in the clusters, we have cluster suites. So usually per cluster we have four cluster suites for redundancy. And uh, actually we we, well, we could handle the whole traffic with just one, but we have four. And uh, usually the cluster is pretty big. One cluster would be probably bigger than this one. And we have one cluster switch at each corner of the cluster. So if we have fire or anything, we can contain the problem and, and we can leave the whole cluster still running. And, uh, and then we have racks. So we use triplets. So our racks is designed by ourselves. It's, Open design as well. So we have three bit racks. Each rack will have like this, as it was three racks, and we have twenty servers in each of the the arrays, and we have like six, like six to fifty servers per rack. It varies a little bit. So in each rack we have a rack switch, and uh, the rack switch is not redundant. So if we lose the rack switch, we lose the whole rack. This this is not a problem at all, because all the servers by requirement and by design. They need to survive a loss, the loss of a whole rack. So if you need, if you if you build a new server in Facebook, your server must survive, a, it must survive a loss of a huge a <coughs> entire data center. So if you lose like all prime view, your service need, need needs to run in other data centers. So this is required. So uh, Facebook is not a big bunch of a big chunk of code. It's basically the site is run by more than 400 services. So you talk to the front end. In the front ends, we we'll talk to the backend service to actually build what we need, what we need to see. And that's all. All the hard work is done by the, the backend service. So we do a lot of PHP, but PHP is all the front end. The hack stuff is all done as well. And uh, so back to the network. So we have the switches, and we have a rack switch, and then from the rack switch, we have our forward balancers, where we basically the our forward balancers they load balance the L7. 
They also have a load balancer. Of the, it's the same thing as saying a reverse proxy, like an HE proxy or Nginx, or Squid, or you know, Apache proxy. So when, you, when you're talking to Facebook, we're always talking to the L7 load balancer. You never establish a connection here. So only the L7 load balancers will talk to the web server. And uh, so these guys here, they have cache, they have like all the logics and everything. And these guys here, are, they, they load balancer, they also have load balancers. So because we have too many of them, so we need like an intermediate layer. I'm responsible for this guy. I'm the service owner of all this layer. Here. And uh, so if this, go, if this goes down, basically the whole site will go down, no problem. And uh, <coughs> so we have 10 giga, uh, 10 giga NICs everywhere. So all the network is 10 giga. And the uplinks from the rack switch to the cluster switch is usually 40 gigas. And some high bandwidth racks we have 80 gigs. And uh, the amount of bandwidth we have from the cluster switch to the data center router is absolutely insane. <laughs> and uh, so in the route perspective, uh, basically all the network is BGP. That's the only route protocol that we use. So each, uh, in all the network is level three. We don't do VLANs or anything. So each rack has a IP report has a slash 24 and uh, also a slash 48, I guess, 46. And uh, everything is routed. So the racks, all the suites are level, level 3 suites and they act as also as a router. And they talk BGP to the cluster suites and they talk BGP to the rest of the network. The backbone is MPLS and over MPLS we run MP. That's for, for, for balance and better network. And we also use ECMP. ECMP stands for Equal Cost Motor F. So all the links are active, active. So there's no hot standby. So if I have uh, 40 gigas or like 14 giga links between the right suite and the cluster suite, we use all of them at the same time. And uh, that's, uh, that's supported by ECMP. That's, that's a common thing. It's nothing new here. Uh, from in this, between these two layers here, we do DSR, that's direct server return. That means that the L4 load analysis, they only see the ingress traffic. So the incoming packets go through the L4 load balancer and get distributed to the L7 load balancer. The L7 load balancer they will respond straight to the, to the clients. So that's a very common uh, load balancer layout. And I would really recommend if you guys are recommending load balancer to do it this way. And uh, we use round robin here for, for the servers. And then this layer here, we use just one. Because it's too many servers. So we just run and select one and magically. <laughs> and uh, I'll talk a little more about this next. Uh, so the L7 RB is proxy. Uh, we use everything that you can make. We use Nginx and we use HAProx, Varnish, Squid. And uh, they're all fine. Like They all get the job done. But as we start scaling and scaling, we got to a point that you know, we need to do something. And basically, we got the, the main strengths of each one and we built something that would solve our problem in a much better way. So I think this will get the software pretty soon, I hope. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, so basically, it's, it's, it's nothing new. It's just OpenSSL, we use for speed, we use speedway, HTTP parses, Node.js, deep event, it's an, uh, it's an asynchronous I/O server. It's also plus plus. It uses Lua for the, all these script mechanisms, so we don't need to remember it all the time. And uh, it integrates very well with our infrastructure. So that was the main reason that we built the proxy. So we have a integration <coughs> mechanism where we can deploy services everywhere. Instead of each server has have a, having a config file, it talks to the configuration infrastructure. Hey, I need my configuration, and then we send that. So that's all version we need. We have all the more monitoring infrastructure. We have alarming and logging. So there is a big framework to coordinate all of this, and that was the main reason that we did the proxy. The same thing with the L4 load balancer. The one that I'm responsible. So my main project there is called Shift, and uh, it's basically an uh, IPVS director. So it's not different than this. So if you if you install Ubuntu and uh, install apt-get, install IPVS at the end, it's the same thing. But we I built we built basically a whole wrapper around it that's written in Python that orchestrates the whole thing because the IPVS does not do health checks and doesn't do monitoring and alarming and everything. So basically, we built uh, a whole script, not script because it's too big, it's a whole software we can write around it. Then we do the hot tracks and it talks to the configuration mechanism and does monitoring around it. But the load balancing itself, like the hard work, is done by the kernel uh, using APVS. APVS is 
this is pretty good. It's not the best thing in the world. It has a lot of bugs. We have contrib contributed to the kernel fixes and bugs. We still have a long list of wish list and bugs that need to fix. But it works pretty well. Like a lot of sites, if you use like Amazon, Elastic Load Balancer, and other cloud solutions, they're all based on this. In terms of proportion, so the L4 load balancers that uh, uh, the first layer there, we have singles to tens per cluster. Usually it would be like six or ten. It depends on bandwidth. They don't have too much CPU work because they are only dispatching packets. So it's more like network bound. So if you have a cluster with a lot of traffic, a lot of incoming traffic, let's say video upload or like photo upload, so we will have more of those because we have too much traffic coming in. As I, as I said before, it, it does not see the traffic that's going now. The second layer will respond straight to the internet. So the next layer, that's the L7 production, we have usually tens to hundreds. So we usually like 100, 150 per cluster. And then we have the web servers. So that's thousands of web servers per cluster. Uh, I could have this page like many, many, many. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a big one. Uh, so come back to Edge. So I'll explain a little bit better how uh, the Edge works. So imagine if you were in Porto Alegre, that's a, a city where I'm from, in the south of Brazil. And uh, you want to talk to Facebook. So the closest data center, geographically, is for the city in uh, North Carolina. So the, the latest to there is 75 milliseconds, round trip latest. So if I want to talk to Facebook there, the first thing that I need to, to do is to establish a connection. So that would cost me like one and a half round trips. So that's basically 200. Because that's the TCP handshake. So that would cost me like 150 per second. But today we do 100% HTTPS for security. And then we have two more round trips to actually exchange the keys and blah, 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 all the SSL stuff. So I'm already like almost a half second. And then I fetch the, I actually send the request and get the response. So I have 600 milliseconds only to give, only network time. Of course, the application will be here, will take like a second more to actually render the whole thing. So I'm spending 600 milliseconds only network time to get the net to get the connection established and to get some code. So when you go to a bot, as I said before, we have just a few servers in the bot. And uh, it would be like not more than 200. Or so they are pretty small, but they are not our, uh, we only rent some space in the big data centers. We don't build anything. And they usually have like one rack switch. Uh, we should usually have like a router also for the peer and everything. And uh, we have two load balancers, or four load balancers, and we have 20 or 7 load balancers. So these machines, they have lots of memory, 200 or even 400 gig of memory we have seen. So because they do cache, and they have a lot of flash disks and spinning disks to do, to cache instead of content for like photos and videos. Yeah, but they don't have web servers. So they, they can only proxy back requests and you can send, they can serve requests from the, from the, from the cache. So going back to the map, so now instead of Porto Negro talking straight to the Forest City, Porto Negro can now talk to Sao Paulo. GRU is the airport code. We use airport codes, airport codes for our site. And uh, so, so between Porto Negro and Sao Paulo, I have 15 milliseconds instead of 60. So the network would be something like this. Uh, so I would establish the whole connection the SSL thing in 90 milliseconds instead of 400. And uh, the request, of course, I need to proxy the request <coughs> back to the, to the data center. So that would still be the same thing. But the total would be 240 instead of like half a second. Uh, but most of the time it's for a static content. Usually most of the stuff that you were fetched for the site is a static content. Because you access your news feed, there's a lot of pictures. And each picture is a different request. So those requests, most of the time, and almost 80% of the time, it would be served by the pop itself because of the cache. And then, would be something like this before and after would be something like this. So that's the reason that we invest a lot of money in bots because it lowers a lot the latency. And that's the reason we have like big CDN networks like Akamai and Amazon Cloudflare and all others. They are growing a lot because people want to be closer to the users. The experience for the, it might be just a milliseconds if you look at like math mathematically, but the, the experience for the user is much better. Especially if you're using TCP and we like have a packet loss and we need to resynchronize to, to get back the packet that we lost. So all of this happen much, much faster between the pop and the users than going all the way back to the data center. So before, so before having the pops, this was the map of latency. So green is good, 
all the rest is crap. So we served very well in the United States and Canada and parts of Mexico. And all the rest, I'm sorry. And then we started growing the pops, as we had the first pops, it was like kind of much better. But this is a bit old, but I think it's, much, it's still much better now. So Brazil is fully green now. And uh, we have pots of age that get much better. And uh, it's a big difference, especially for the users, it's a big difference. As I said before, as we're moving to mobile, pack to loss is now a constant problem. So we always have pack to loss in front of 3G and 4G networks. So TCP is horrible. TCP was designed like several years ago, and uh, you never take it, you never took into consideration like wireless networks. And uh, so it handles pretty, pretty bad. Like you need all the packs. If you lose one pack, your whole string is interrupted, and then you need to you need a recovery mechanism to recover the pack that you lost. And that costs a lot of run trip. So as close as I am, to, the closer I am to the user, the better and the faster it will be to solve that problem. And uh, that's why a lot of people in research and university, university have been studying the next, the future protocols to replace this speed on this front. Because this speed is pretty bad. So we need to get an answer in the next, next few years to replace this speed. So Google has something they are working on quick. MIT has been doing like a lot of work in the eight days. So it won't happen soon, but it will happen like sometime. So IPv6. Hmm? <laughs> IPv6 does not solve the problem. No, it's just... Yeah, IPv6, uh, yeah, the, the main problem that we have today in terms of round trips is the, is the L4 layer, not the L3. So IPv6 solves a big problem, that's NAT and the lack of IP address. So for you, for you guys have an idea, we are, our network, our network inside the data center uh, is addressed with a 10 slash 8 network. And uh, we are running out of IP address. So our whole slash 10 is basically running out. So, the new clusters, I think most of Iowa, probably all of the clusters will be, will be IPv6 only. And in a few years, all of, all of the clusters will be IPv6 only. So, we only talk to the internet in dual stack, it will be 4 and 6. And the reverse procs, the L7 procs, will talk v6 to you. We we'll talk before to the clients, more v6, and we'll talk only v6 back to the servers. Because we don't have more IPv6. And uh, this is very limited. Today we, we have IPv6 everywhere today, but it's two stack. Uh, so this is my team. It's a little bit out of date. We have a few more people. So most of the teams there are pretty small. This is considered to be a big team. So we have 40 people. So we don't have one. And uh, so most of the stuff are run by like a, a small group of people, and uh, most of them are super smart. And this is pretty cool. Yeah, very glad to work. I like the guy in the red hat. Red hat. Is he useful? The Santa cap. Yeah. Second row, second from the right, second from the right. Oh, right, yeah, that's the <laughs> <a> manager, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's the <a> manager. Younger and younger. He must have been an engineer. Did he whine a lot? Yeah, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, the field uh, tester. Uh, 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 <laughs> and uh, so that's it. I'm open for questions, so feel free to ask whatever. Wow. Yeah, last week, Ed showed. That last world map you showed, is it that expensive to get a connection into Australia? Yes. Australia is insanely expensive. And the most of the network is run by Telstra there. It's like a, yeah. almost a big amount of anomalies. Undersea cables. Yeah, undersea cables, yeah. But usually it's more more than geographical problem is like offering demand. Like getting to Africa is insanely expensive. And, uh, Brazil has the same problem. There's just a few cables running down there, so it's super expensive. Australia is it's not as expensive as South America and Africa, but it's still much more expensive than countries around it, like uh, Asia, like the Southeast Asia. Yeah, because I noticed you're in, a, in Indonesia, it doesn't seem like it's that long a cable to get from yeah. there to... Yeah. <laughs> we don't have the cables, of course. We are part of a consortium in Southeast Asia. There is a cable, there's a new cable that's connected to several countries, and uh, we are part of the consortium. So we have a few well, you're not you're not running the cable. You no, it's, the it's, question it's, is, it's what's the rent? <laughs> we have like two little traffic. Like a few terabits of traffic is not when uh, to, to justify the investment in the cable. So basically, we buy capacity in the cable, and most of the time we don't buy dark fiber. We just buy lambdas, waves of the fibers. So we don't have full control on the edge. That's pretty bad because for security, especially, we don't have full control on that. And uh, here in the US, we are connecting, we are, this is a new project, we are connecting most of the data centers using dark fiber. 
So we are buying the, the cable. Not the, the whole cable, but strains in the cable. Mm -hmm. So we can run our own DWM system on the cable and we can do pretty much whatever we want. So that's how we are, we are doing 100 gigs. So there's no in, there's no any telecommunication vendor in the West selling 100 gigabits yet. So they only sell 10 gigabits. And uh, you know, before we go too much further, you asked me to stop recording during the questions and answers? Uh, yeah, it would be nice. Stop recording? Okay. Yeah.